Welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, our WURD from consumer to creator, how black communities can transform technology consumption into economic power. Thank you all for coming. Grab your food and find your seat. We're gonna get ready to start this uh, fantastic panel in just a minute. I'm Sarah Lomax Reese, I'm the president and CEO of WURD and I'm really, really happy to partner again with uh, Wilco and Bridget Daniel and Philly Tech Week to put together this, um, this wonderful conversation about technology and black folks, which um, at this point in time has to be completely integrated. And so we're really, really excited to be a part of Philly Tech Week. And actually, I'm really happy to announce that I won the Activist of the Year Award yesterday <laughs> at, at one of Philly Tech Week's um, events, uh, the RAD Awards last night, so that was kind of cool. Um, but we are really happy, and what I'd like to ask people to do is just kind of fill in the center, because um, what tends to happen is people crowd onto one side, and we want to make sure that um, we fill in and I want to really thank our sponsors, Fulton Bank, who is sponsoring today's event, and um, our event partner, Ticket Leap, which is right over there. They've got lots of great snacks and things. And of course, the Free Library of Philadelphia, who um, are hosting us today. So we're really grateful for the partnership with the Free Library. And um, so I just want to um, invite people to grab something to eat, like I said, and take a seat, because we have a fantastic panel. And right now, I want to introduce Bridget Daniel, who is the Executive Vice President of Wilco Electronic Systems, and she's gonna be our moderator for today. So, Bridget Daniel, come on. Good afternoon, WRD family. We are back again, another year later, another year around the sun. Uh, it's Philly Tech Week, and what we do best is we bring information and access and different types of perspectives to the conversation um, that broadens the tech sector here in our communities in Philadelphia. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Bridget Daniel. I'm executive of uh, Wilco Electronic Systems. We are a private cable company and one of the last of our kind that really promotes and serves and uh, provides technology that's affordable to low income and underrepresented communities. So we partner with uh, WRD every year because the conversations that we need to have in the community need to be taken at a different way and addressed in a different manner and have people that can speak and address it in a way that we can consume ourselves. And this year we wanted to focus on a topic that I think is very, very needed because we're at a time when technology is everywhere. It's, it's literally in, it, pervasively in everything that we do every single day. And one of the things that Sarah and I always do before we start really thinking about our, our Tech Week topic is what is the community needing to know? What do we need to move, our, move the dial, particularly in terms of economic empowerment? And what we're seeing right now is that um, African Americans and Latinos or black and other black and brown people, Asian communities, et cetera, but really black people are consuming technology in a way that is over indexing everybody. But yet we're not participating it and really getting the wealth from it. So that's just start a little bit with what we know. If you guys don't mind, that's just jump right into the conversation. Is everybody okay with that? Are we all good with that? All right, so this is what we do know about um, this topic. So black millennials are closing the digital divide with their avid use of mobile technology. Their engagement on social media also tops the charts, especially in raising awarenesses of issues in the black community. To the point that a recent Nielsen report has stated that black millennials are leading the way in their use of technology to impact change and get their voices heard. And this report ironically comes as the nation's tech companies have been under scrutiny for several years on its inability to increase the diversity of its mostly white and Asian workforce to compete in an increasingly global marketplace. And African-American buying power is on the rise. So why is that important? Because technology, and I think we can all at least agree to some point, 
that technology is the next great wealth building opportunity in America. But we are not a part of that conversation. We are not at the table like we should be, and we should be much more, um, at least at least in terms of what we consume, we should be much more integrated in how it gets to us and why it gets to us and that we're a part of how it gets to us. So this, this panel will examine underrepresented communities, how we can best transition from being the highest consumers of technology to also participating as creators of technology. One, two, how the tech community can increase diversity in their organizations by valuing the economic buying power of the black community. How can we get people and companies to say, oh, that's a marketplace that we need to make sure is value. And three, how the black community can utilize its overconsumption of technology to build wealth and forward economic empowerment. Well, today we have an excellent panel of stellar people and organizations and initiatives that have been working on this issue through their own organizations or just are experts in the field of venture capital, digital entrepreneurship, um, and really working on workforce development and apprenticeship programs that are all about technology creation. I'd like to just introduce them and then we'll start into our panel discussion. I'll allow them to just talk a little bit about who they are, why they are, or why they're here, and then we'll jump into it. But I'd like to at least start to my far left with Tim Rees. Tim is a technology and finance officer, a technologist and actually finance officer, and he's actually also the former state treasurer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So we have some very high gravitas with Mr. Reese being on this panel. Thank you, sir. And next to uh, Mr. Reese, we have Dr. Kevin Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the president and CEO of OIC, which is the Opportunities Industrialization Center of Philadelphia, long time respected organization. And what I love about what Dr. Johnson's vision is that he is definitely moving OIC into the direction of workforce development and technology, which is definitely needed. To his uh, right, we have Dr. Jamie Bracey. Dr. Jamie Bracey is the director of the STEM Education and Outreach and Research. She's founding director of Pennsylvania Mesa, which I'd like her to definitely talk more about us today. And that's at Temple University College of Engineering. Dr. Bracey, so glad to have you. And to her right, we have Dean Harris. Dean is a senior managing partner of Silicon Philosophies and the CEO of Free Haven Media. Also long-term, long-time technologist in the Philadelphia area. And we'll be joined very shortly by also Dr. Michelle Johnson. She's the director of Rehabilitation Robotics Lab, assistant professor of physical medic medicine and rehab, and assistant professor in bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Wow. So you can see what we have of this panel. This panel is going to definitely direct us in a very good uh, conversation about all of these various issues and really from a very varied type of uh, perspective. So let's just start with actually just uh, Mr. Mr. Reese. If you'd like to just tell us a little bit about who you are and your, your history with, with technology and innovation and just a little bit about your background. Sure, well again, thank you and uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm glad we all are here and assembled to talk about this issue. Um, as was noted by Bridget, I was the former state treasurer of Pennsylvania. Um, and as a treasurer of Pennsylvania, we were the bank for Pennsylvania. We had $100 billion of deposits that I managed, and we had a $10 billion investment portfolio that I chaired. But that's not why I'm here. Why I'm here is because before that, for 21 years, I ran my own private investment bank that focused on technology as from an entrepreneurial standpoint and an investment standpoint. We sold a number of companies. Matter of fact, we've invested about $100 million. We got about $400 million in uh, exit value on those companies, and those companies were sold both uh, publicly and privately. And my uh, degree is in engineering. Uh, I, oper I, I am a scientist sort of the way I operate when I was building companies. So I have a long history in this uh, beginning in 89. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Word, for uh, this forum. And thank you, Bridget, for all your leadership here in the city. Uh, Kevin Johnson, uh, I am really coming from it from the consumer side and happened to um, lead the role of being the CEO of Philadelphia OIC. 
Uh, growing up in Texas, I was always around technology. Uh, TI was there, Motorola was there, and obviously Dell Computers got its start there in, in Austin. But as I continued to you know, grow and go to different places, and particularly the role at OIC, I was really concerned about workforce development. And at the time, we only had one workforce program, and that was focused on hospitality. Now, the mm -hmm. uh, salary, uh, the hourly rate that a person would start out with is around $11 an hour. Uh, when you look at that annually, that's less than $23,000 a year. And so if our mission was to address issues of poverty, unemployment, and illiteracy, then we had to change our workforce model. And so technology, we started to look at all the jobs that were out there, and we started to see that people could work for about you know, $30 an hour, which would be around you know, north of around you know, $50,000 or $40,000 uh, a year. Uh, that made us look at it from a totally different standpoint. So I am here as a consumer initially, but now because of my role at OIC, trying to help people get jobs so that they can be a part of tech community. Dr. Bracey. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Jamie Bracey, and I come at technology from both a, uh, uh, a creative uh, perspective. I actually am the founder of Creative TechWorks Design Studio, which provides opportunity to youth ages 18 to 26 with the city of Philadelphia's first registered software apprenticeship, software development apprenticeship. So we are going at making, and I'm going to be working with OIC very closely, mm -hmm. but I also want to share with you that I am here because I was a warrior mother who has three sons who did not have a clear pathway into technology, although we were using it. So we couldn't find a STEM program for my son, so we created STEM programs, not just for them, but for their, their friends. Uh, the reason that we, we moved into software development, computer programming is what everyone's calling it, but it's really software development, is because of the brother on my right, Dean Harris, who will speak to you. But Temple is where we house most of our programs. And we'll talk a little bit later about how we should, as a community, leverage these institutions much better than we are doing to produce the talent. But one of the things I wanted to share with you is that Dean came to a technology symposium that was hosted at Temple University. Almost everybody on the panel was talking about this conversation six years ago. Uh, the young black men and Latino men who were in that room who were convened by Senator Leanna Washington at that time lined up to speak to Dean Harris who said, I will teach you to forget being a nine to five person. Right. I'll teach you how to go into the market. He then came to me to say, Doc, can we open up Temple University to host coding classes for kids? That entire cohort is graduating between now and next year from college, from starting six years ago. And several of them serve on the board of directors of the Creative TechWorks Design Studio. So we're building an ecosystem that looks at talent, but also looks at how do we now leverage all of our collective energy into rebuilding, rebranding North Philadelphia similar to what's happening in West and South Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So we're welcoming any conversations, mm -hmm. any contribution mm -hmm. to that, and I want to hand it off to Brother Dean, who again mm -hmm. launched us in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Dr. Bracey. Um, <clears throat> I'm Dean Harris, and I guess I've been in technology all my life. Um, I spent 12 years as a researcher at Bell Labs in the 80s, and we worked on everything from cell phones to internet to everything you can think of. Um, I guess if I got any claim to fame at all, in the early 90s, I took a consultant position at Toshiba Advanced Research, and that position became the, the world's first DVD studio. The first 50,000 DVD masters came out of that studio. I was the lead software developer, and we won a technical Emmy um, mm -hmm. for that work. So we initiated the DVD industry. Right. I was a Warner Brothers and Toshiba a partnership. Um, after that, me and another uh, engineer from Toshiba created a company called Front Porch Video, <coughs> which we uh, leveraged all our uh, knowledge of DVD development. It worked for Sony, HBO, um, Comcast, Microsoft, um, getting them involved in, in digital video in the, in the mid-90s. Um, but beyond all of the technical stuff, um, always was connected to the community. So we actually moved our company from Princeton down the fourth and south, where we would have an incubator kind of in the 90s. We would do software development, but we had <clears throat> people doing graphics and music and all types of stuff. That place was never empty. Um, so my whole life has been involved in, in technology and, 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 and entrepreneurship. But I want, what I want to say is that there's a movement going on now that 
um, you may not notice it, but there's a un- kind of an underground railroad effect hmm. where <laughs> if, you, if you keep your eyes open and keep your ears open, you're going to see before the end of the year a lot of African-American-owned companies m- moving into the marketplace in this region right, hmm. uh, right before the end of 2017. So uh, I'm making that statement. Hmm. <laughs> and I like to find out why, but definitely, right, yes. yeah, let's find out why. But yeah, I'm sorry, Dina. So I, you know, I don't want to say too much, but mm-hmm. no, I want to pass it off to, to the good doctor here. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Johnson, and I am, I would say I've been in Philadelphia now for four years. I actually went to the University of Pennsylvania and did my mechanical engineering bachelor's degree there. Mm-hmm. Then I kind of moved out and was in Southern California, Northern California. So I did my PhD in mechanical engineering. I'm one of the few people, I I go back to when we were graduating and there might have been just six of us (laughs) um, who were black and in the, and graduating the cohort and very few mechanical engineers, um, especially women as well. So um, my expertise in this area is in robotics. I'm essentially a scientist and I have a lab and I'm looking at developing systems for all people. I think that's my plug is that we shouldn't have to be privileged to be able to get rehabilitation or health care. And I look at using technology to help people with disability. One of the key things where I was excited about being on this panel was that one of my passions is to try to get more um, underrepresented, my more black students, women and men, into the STEM field. And having, uh, and being a rarity, I mean, there's not that many black uh, faculty at Penn doing technology is to be present myself as a role model, some, some place that students who are interested can come check out my lab. I have parents who are like, oh, my son's interested in robotics. I'm like, bring them by, you know, just to even see and to know that this is possible. I mean, that's the role I play. And also to encourage um, young women and men to c- overcome that self-doubt. Uh, one of the key things that I see that prevents people from thinking about higher levels in terms of engineering, in terms of pursuing their masters, in terms of pursuing their doctorate, is this sense of, I don't think I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's so Mm -hmm. common. And it's to say, look, um, this is about, the P in PhD is about persistence. (laughs) I I always say that because there's smarter, there are smarter people in the world than me. (laughs) And I, I have a PhD, well, one, by the grace of God, two, by the fact that it was persistence and I had mentors that encouraged me to say, you can do this. Are mm. you willing to work hard? Are you willing to stay and, and figure out that math problem, figure out that science problem? You can do this. And so a part of the, the, the for me, is the transforming that mind into, hey, I'm able to do this work. I have a good mind and then I'm able. And then to, to ask then the questions that get students excited um, about working in technology. And my advocate is you got to get the students when they're really, really young and they're still curious about how things work. And if we can plug them in in that space, then I think we have a a better chance of getting them to the the space of the bachelors and the masters and the PhD. I'm not saying everyone is that's their goal, but that's a part of my mission is to see more of us come through in the academic space so that we have and present role models to students as they come in through and their learning. So given all that, and before we actually start with a couple of questions, I just want to make sure everyone knows that we are hashtagging, we are social media tonight or this afternoon. Our hashtag is consume to create. Hashtag consume to create. That's the first one. And the second one is hashtag WRD Wilco PTW17. So that's WRD, W-I-L-C-O, P-T-W-17. Definitely want to make sure we are trending and we are quoting and documenting all this great information. So just in terms of the topic from consumer to creator, and I'd like to start with Dr. Bracey because, and and actually also Dr. Michelle Johnson, because you guys actually do more work with youth, um, particularly at a younger 
point in their in their in their careers and in, actually in their livelihoods. But why do you think Black youth use technology more than other races? Like, is there a reason for that? Is it cultural? Is it just age? Just because of where we are right now and in just in our, our our time of of life, or what is the fascination? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Why do Black youth, particularly black males, oversubscribe according to Pew's most recent uh, support and I, a report. And I think that um, I don't really have a very good answer for that. I think part of our culture is curiosity. Mm. And we also come, if we go back 5,000 years, we come from a culture of creators, right? Mm. So the first civilizations were created. We all know this story. Mm. Uh, but I actually want to spin this a little bit on its head. Yep. May, Dr. Mae Jemison, most of us know who that is, first mm -hmm. black woman in space, received before o President Obama left office the nation's largest contract to develop the 100-year Starship project to use technologies, engineering, and mathematics and physics to get human beings to Mars. The thought that 100 years from now somebody will be using technologies or dreaming of technologies now that are used in the future that is being led by a black woman needs to be something that we're talking about, not our, just our current here and now, but the fact that there are people out there who are working on the future. And so how black youth see themselves in the here and now, but also as producers of the kind of knowledge that's going to get us to another planet mm -hmm. is, is one of the benefits, I think, and I wanna, I wanna have Michelle also speak to this. We really need to understand what is the power and the purpose of getting an undergraduate or a graduate degree. Mm. What is the usefulness of these institutions? Because many of us understand we can go out and get certified now. Right. We can get a two-year degree. Right. We can go to a boot camp. You don't necessarily have to go to college to become viable in this field. But there are some benefits to it that we don't tell young people enough. And it has little to do with the degree and everything to do with access to resources. Yeah. I leveraged the mess out of Temple's resources. <laughs> I put Temple's resources in the community and vice versa. That is why, right. that is why we've been so successful because we've, we've reduced this barrier to access and to understanding. I can create a makerspace, Reverend Johnson can create a makerspace, Tim can invest in some business startups, but a lot of the resources the laser cutters, yeah, the, right. the Arduino system, mm -hmm. the computer labs are in these institutions that we are more often than not fighting about gentrification, and rightly so, but there's a reverse positivity to using these institutions because their mission is to support community. So whether or not our young people use technology for now mm -hmm. and oversubscribe to it, some of it's popularity, yep. some of it is, you know, it's, it's something that I'm really good at, and so there's a psychological need to touch, feel, work with something you like, and some of it is the freedom that technology gives you to not be bound to those of us in higher education or out in the community. I can create what I want right. using technology. So there's a freedom, the Underground Railroad is found in technology, and I think that may be organically what our young people are moving towards. They wanna be free. Right, Yeah. right. How about you, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> uh, Michelle Johnson? There's two Dr. Johnsons, yeah, so I want to make so. sure I, I, I want to see your full name. Um, so I actually absolutely agree with that. And I, I want to kind of probably bring up three points. Mm. One is I think we love innovation, and mm. they come in different points. I, th I remember back when I was young in the rap movement and kind of innovating on music. And I think with electronics and, and the new technology, it, it's an embodiment of this innovation space. And, but I think we need to turn it on our heads and not just love it and consume it, but begin to get black youths to ask themselves, how can I make this? How can I be the next generation of innovators? So I think a part of that is exposure mm -hmm. and then getting them, I like to say, to tinker to tinker, take that DVD apart, take the radio apart, take the Beats uh, um, you know, microphone, take it apart, how does it work? And then to ask those questions and say, well, it's producing this music better than this one, how did then I become a part of making sure that that's a, even a better system? So it's a part of being uh, encouraging the tinkering and asking those questions. I think the second piece about the importance, and I'm not saying 
you know, a PhDs for everyone or master's degrees for everyone. But the reality is, unless you, unless we we encourage a subset of our population to move into these spaces, we left get left out of the the ability to make these decisions and the content of the future. I think in terms of my lab, I like to encourage you know black youth to come in. Hey, hang out. Spend one semester with me, get exposed, get the resources, and then figure out what you want to do. And a part of that process is to know, unless we have students coming into the bachelor's program in science and engineering, and even encouraging some to go on and pursue the master's, to go on and to pursue the PhD, we'll still be left with that level of access that's not available. And unfortunately, certain things, um, the, the some power comes with the PhD. Not, I'm not saying money, because that sure doesn't happen with the PhD, not necessarily. Right. But there is some power to right. innovate, to create, to define the next uh, future questions that we're asking. And I want to encourage that we, we have that dialogue with our young kids, that you too can be, you know, a Dr. Jamison. Um, you can you can too can be sitting on and teaching in this future the third thing I want to say that I think is super important for youth to, to consider and I want to echo this resource issue you know um, there's a move on college campuses to create the next level of incubators uh, innovate innovating spaces for students to be a part of changing the future in technology I just sat through a Penn just started this Penn Health Tech Center. Hmm. It's this brand new center, and the goal of this center is to encourage medical and advances in the medical field and to bring in together technologists with the, with the School of Medicine and the, 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 uh, the biologists, et cetera, to come and advance that area. One of the things they said was, we want to encourage all our students to participate. And we then want to, you have an idea, a student, freshman, sophomore, can pitch it and then get resources to begin to incubate. I mentored two a, a black and Latino uh, um, a student uh, group who won the Penn's Innovation Prize for technology. And that gave them access to uh, mentors to develop their idea into a company. Hmm. So that's the resource I think that affiliating with you know places like Penn and Temple mm -hmm. can get our students and then launch them, help to launch them into the future. So Dr. Kevin Johnson, since you um, look at workforce development and OIC has such a, been a, a very long history in development of different skill sets, particularly for, for, for black people and, and, and communities of color, what have been you seen? So we've heard Dr. Michelle Johnson, Dr. Bracey talk about you know, their programs and you know, just this inherent part of our DNA to be innovators. Have you been seeing that in the young people that come through your door, because they're older, um, and they're looking for different opportunities, right? OIC, different way to get into the industry, different entry point. What are you seeing um, in terms of just wanting and desires and um, an ambition to be innovators? So at OIC, we have addressed this from two ways. Uh, one, there's an adult population, but then there's also a younger population. So in our middle school programs at H.A. Brown, we introduced last year a uh, program in which the kids, they basically put together GPS devices. And how it really came about is that the students had a question, where can you find healthy food in my community? Mm -hmm. And so with that, they developed these GPS devices and learned a whole deal about technology, uh, the 3D uh, machine, and just other things. And so it was a great experience for them. But also on the adult side, we help people out with just getting basic computer knowledge. Uh, just how do you use the computer? How do you set up an email? How do you use Microsoft Office? And then the question from there is, uh, you taught me this and I'm now able to use a computer, but I want to learn how does this computer work? And that's a very different type of question. And so that led us to look at not just how can we show people the basics, but how can we turn this to workforce development uh, for people who come to the community who want to be involved in this space. And so our approach is really two-pronged. One is to start with young people as early as possible. That's what we did at H.A. Brown. Last year we also had a coding boot camp mm -hmm. at Parkway High School, and we also partnered with Wilco 
uh, in, in that initiative, but also from an adult perspective, because when you look at it, um, there are plenty of opportunities that are there. When you look at the tech industry, it's not just being a coder. Sometimes you need people to be computer support specialists. You need other folk to be the engineers, software developers. So there's a whole field that is out there. And so the way that we try to approach it at Philadelphia OIC is looking at the various ways in which we can have these different entry points uh, for people to get involved. But also another piece that we are really working on right now is not just for them to go and work at companies, but really what we're talking about here today, and that is to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because the tech space is one of the best spaces for you to become an entrepreneur and for you to work for yourself for you to set your own hours, for you to begin to pursue business for yourself. But putting that, bi that business plan together is gonna be key. And that's our next phase for Philadelphia OIC. Absolutely, so you just said it. So tech is one of the best places to become an entrepreneur. Yes. So Tim, in your just history of one, being a VC, and then also being having the privilege and honor to look at it from such a high level in the state, where are where is money going? Is it going to you know young people that we say get into tech? We get great something. You're going to get you know you become rich and famous. You're the next Mark Zuckerberg. Or is it really just more of a very organic, um, homegrown, slower process? Like how can we get at the table if you're a young person? What what makes sense? What makes it a reality coming from your standpoint of a VC? Um, so. Um I would go back, first of all, the, the, the opening dialogues are very interesting hmm. because I think you have to, um, we need to think about this in the context that there's a discussion here that has many, several different parallel right. tracks. Right. So on one end, we're talking about research, mm -hmm. research and design. So where our, our good doctors are talking about um, the pursuit of advanced degrees, the, the, and then taking that and creating either a career or uh, some other things for that, that is a, a value. Um, the other aspect of getting a job and saying, I wanna get a job mm. is, a, is another thing, right. which is working either for Apple, Facebook, right. Snapchat, Instagram, right. uh, on and on, Different path, even right. Verizon and Comcast. Absolutely, people don't even think about those companies as tech companies. So right. that's a thing. Then there's the other part of that, which is the money part. Right, and that's a different conversation. And R and D and sometimes the investment doesn't go together. By the way, mm -hmm. not not a lot of scientists are able. There is a lot. You can go to any one of these major three major three major institutions or more in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia and look in the library and you will see thousands of R&D science-based um, intellectual property that is either owned by the university that mm -hmm. the, the professor co-founded, <laughs> but is not being commercialized, okay? So um, what I've found over, 20, over those years in investing in many companies is that um, I agree and say that education is essential. Right. It is, a, is, is essential. And it's even, it's even as simple as knowing how to write, knowing how to write your mm. idea down. Mm. That's vital. Right. There, it, 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 it tells me you, you, people want to gloss over that and just go right to the emotional heart string of right. give me an opportunity. Mm. But you can't ignore that. Mm -mm. Right. So it, you, you can't go from zero to 100. And most people think that the idea of technology or starting an, a company is zero to 100. Mm. It's not zero to 100. Mm -mm. We don't even invest zero to 100. Mm. The chances are you're going to take it to 100 are very, very mm. unlikely. Mm. So what we're trying to look at is who are you? Mm. You are the brand. Right. So that's another discussion. Uh, we were in a, an event in State College where they asked me to come up because the, fo the football players, a football player started a branding company as an entrepreneur. And what I, what I was listening to, what I saw was this was a guy, educated, played college football, but was not afraid to ask questions. He was articulate, and I probably believe he could write well. <laughs> and he was able to get that company, and it's an African-American, but his company is diverse. 
and they were able to get some of the biggest clients in the world within the first year. But I think his brand of being a football player allowed him to get access to those bigger clients. But his ability to deliver was even bigger. So when I look at the idea of money, there's tons of money out there. There's more money for minority startups than there are minorities that can actually mm. access the money. Can you repeat that one more time? There's Tim? more money for minority startups out there. Okay? So, because money mm. is chasing a return. Mm. Money doesn't chase a color. Right. Mm. Right. Money chases a return. How did I get successful? Right. There was nothing special about me. I didn't have any. I fit this standard profile. If you look at the, the, the stats, the average, so 95%, this is old stats, but 95% of all entrepreneurs have a bachelor's degree. Mm. Only 47% have an advanced degree. Mm. Uh, uh, 1% actually came from money, less than 1%. So we all fit the profile. I think our issues, I'm gonna go just spin it and because I, I gotta turn it back over, yeah. is I look at the other social economic issues here. We looked at the movie Hidden Figures. Mm -hmm. We saw what a great job and that, that went away. Mm. Why, I don't know why, right? We need to figure out why. We look at the community versus the individual. That's where I look at it a lot. The community versus an individual. You're not gonna get there as an individual. You gotta get there as a community. Mm. And you gotta, you gotta understand the power of what it really is the power of money. Right. The power of money is not to go buy things. Mm -hmm. That's just an affect of it. Right. Of course, you, we got launched into this, we got launched into the American economy after the economy was already developed and they learned the rules of entrepreneurship. Right. So we need to be able to understand what are we trying to do when we do something and what are the, um, right. and what do we expect to be the outcomes? That is a better conversation to mm. a, an, an investor and doing that over a period of time, thinking you're gonna run into an investor mm. and at one time get them to give you $2 million. They need to know who you are. They need to know your brand. So picking off of a statement that you just said, we're gonna do this not as an individual but as a community. It, it's really interesting because on this panel we have probably every part of the ecosystem that goes from Dr. Bracey and Dr. Michelle Johnson teaching youth at a young age, going then to Dean Harris, they work with him, he's been doing the one to zero to 100, or they go to Dr. Kevin Johnson and they get another skill set, either in a job or building, and then they get to Tim Reese. Right. So it's a very interesting panel that we have but getting to zero to 100, that takes years. That doesn't just happen overnight, right? Like that's a long process. My father, Wilco, that's 40 years in the game, right? Yeah. You only, you sometimes don't make that big deal until 20 years in the game. So question, and then I like to throw it to Dean, but just wanna put this in your hat, cause I'm actually just thought about it, Tim, when you were talking about it. Are we then being naive as a community to try to tell youth that like, why are we teaching them tech? Are they really going to get to build wealth? Is it just to have them exposed so that they can participate with the other kids that are privileged and get to participate and tinker? Or is this really the way forward? We know it is conceptually, but are we really moving the dial? And Dean, because I know you've been in the game, you are like the zero to 100 and then some and around the corner. Like, like what's your perspective on this? Because you are what a lot of my friends call you. You're one of the godfathers of the tech scene. You have birthed a lot of people um, who are teaching those to be in tech. But again, when I have conversations like this, it kind of makes me a little pessimistic or where are we going with it? Well, <clears throat> always, my advice is always to become a subject matter expert, whatever mm -hmm. you do. Um, skills prevent, your skill will, will give you opportunity whether you want to work a job or do entrepreneurship. So you got to, you know, like basketball, you, you know, you got to dedicate yourself to becoming the best at what you do. So it's, just, it's the same thing, whether it's technology or basketball, or baseball, or anything else, right. boxing. Right. Um, the actually, and, you know, I, I spend a lot of time out in Silicon Valley, so there's a lot of people who are going to zero to 100 pretty quickly right. out there. Right. <laughs> What's that Malcolm Gladwell? Um, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Yeah, yeah 10,000 right. hours is a metaphor of mm -hmm. just becoming an expert at something. Right. Right. So uh, if you love something, I call it the love model. If mm -hmm. you love something, like a child, you don't have to tell a child to practice. Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell a child to practice play. So if you love something, you automatically do it. So I always tell people, follow a love interest 
and not a career interest. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't really love it, when it gets hard, you're gonna stop, uh, basically. So, yes, right, when you hit the big, when you, whenever you hit the jackpot, you hit the jackpot. But the thing about it is being personally sustainable. Once you're personally sustainable, you've already hit a minor jackpot, which means that you can eat uh, whatever you do, you can eat off what you know. Okay. Okay. That's what you can buy a job, you can work a job. And going further and getting qualified for people like Tim and the venture community, then that's another thing. That's a brand, and that's how you organize around the idea. And also, um, you know, it's like sometimes, no matter how smart you are, it is, it is who you know. That is true. <laughs> that is true. I've seen, Particularly in tech. Yeah, yeah I, I tell people, uh, I'm a, people say I'm pretty smart, but every big deal, somebody knew me. Relationships. <laughs> right, so, so no matter what it, I think I knew, it was who I knew that really mm -hmm. also made the deal happen as well. And so, we'll unpack that a, a bit, because I want to go back to the relationship part, but Dr. Michelle Johnson, you, you, you want to definitely weigh in on that? Yeah, I just had two points. I wanted to say um, a part of kind of giving kids exposure is I think in many times um, our, our, our kids don't count ourselves in. We don't see ourselves there. Right. We don't see ourselves as the innovator. Right. Which is why I think the importance of exposure and, and role model and someone affirming on the inside, you can do this, you can do this. Yes, you, you have what it takes and we're reminding that. There's an interesting fact that is about women that women, no matter what the color, actually need to be told externally that they're able to do engineering. There is actually mm. documented fact that women do not come to conclusion about their science and technology prowess on their own. They need a role model, someone telling them externally, hey, you can do this and this is a good career for you. So given that, I think that same issue is when you're in an underrepresented minority company, mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, um, community where you're not seeing a, enough of these role models, you're saying those same things to yourself. You're, you're in that imposter syndrome, they call it, where you're questioning whether you should be here. So I think hmm. the, what, um, what you said, Bridget, about the, I think we should, we should keep the press, the exposure, um, okay. getting the kids involved and staying involved because okay. that's important. You know, I want to I, I, I yep. jump in mm -hmm. on these two between Dean and Silicon Valley. I think that's an essential conversation piece. Mm -hmm. it's, it, Silicon Valley is the unicorn yep. of the galaxy. <laughs> One third of all money invested in the world is invested within 25 50 mile radius, 25 mile radius wow. of mm. San Francisco. Mm. The other third is the rest of the United States, the other third is the rest of the world. Mm. So Silicon is different because when, when he says zero to 100, what he's saying is these unicorn, these unicorn companies, they don't, they're not profitable. What they're doing, they're being built up for economic value mm. so they can then take, being take public so the venture capital can make their return. Okay. Okay. The entrepreneur has to stay for n a number of years right. to earn their equity from the public offering and it's restricted. Right. And then they'd be worth the billions of dollars. Understood. That, that, that whole relationship is why diversity is at a minimal mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And so I think the pursuit of that is kind of, if you're not in the room as an investor, understand that they're being, that investment is being staged. It's not coming in one shot. Mm -hmm. They're trying to reach certain metrics. So that's isn't it's it's zero to get to here, get to here, get to here, run as fast as you can be. So it's creating its own sort of uh, I won't call it incestuous, but it's it's not always good. Absolutely. And it's not allowing diversity right. um, because of that, because right. it's a who you know type of thing. Right. So I do right. think we just need to to understand that Silicon Valley is different. Right. But the thing that you mentioned is are you better off? having to be an entrepreneur. You don't even have to go through technology. Right. 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 You, you, I think for the African American that's what I'm saying, is this a community issue mm. or is it an individual issue? Right. Mm. So today, because it's Tech Week, we're gonna keep it around tech. tech. But <laughs> right. this is an issue about the community, about us right. being entrepreneurial okay. and understand what the social economic impact right. looks like of having people who are working for themselves. Yeah. Right. And, and even from a workforce kind of standpoint, I mean, when you look at the tech companies, 
they lack diversity. I mean, if you mm -hmm. look at the major tech companies, about 3% of them African-American, 2% are Hispanic. Um, the realities of breaking that culture, not saying that we can't break through, and you know, initially my team and I, we were kind of on this, we gotta help our folk from the community get jobs. And then one of my staff members said, why are we doing this? Mm. Hmm. Why don't we become our own job creators? Okay. And so, because when you look at tech, I mean, for the most part, it, it, it can be colorblind because you don't even have to interface with right. the other person. And so right. that helped us to start, really start changing the conversation. Right. Instead of just preparing people for jobs, let's start creating innovators because we already have the wherewithal and we already have the, uh, the tenacity to really stay right. in the game. And so instead of trying to make you know, Apple like us, instead of trying to make you know, these larger companies like us, we have the wherewithal within ourselves. And that's why I appreciate what Dr. Bracey is doing at Temple, mm -hmm. uh, what others around this table are doing, is because instead of sitting up here asking someone, you know, we're going out there doing the fishing ourselves. And that's the, really the only way, Bridget, right. that I think we're gonna make some headway, is that we have to produce our own entrepreneurs and our own innovators. No, I understand, Dr. Johnson. And, and you know, as being a pastor, what's the parable? You teach a man to fish, blah, 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 blah. But right, right. so it, we, we all know it, right? right? Um, but let me throw something out and then Dr. Brace, I wanted you to chime in because, but what's wrong with getting just a job in tech, right? Can we still just get them jobs in tech? Like, so Tim, you talk about unicorns in Silicon Valley. Most people won't even ever get to Silicon Valley. Like, you know, North Philly is not getting to Silicon Valley. And I'm not saying they can't, I'm just saying it's like getting in the NBA or getting in the NFL. <laughs> You know, it's very hard. And I think sometimes everyone wants to be like, that'd be next Mark Zuckerberg. That's just be you and do what you want to do and, and get the resources to that. But if that's the case, what's wrong with just training people to just get a good job? Like just make a livelihood that you feel proud of and that you're contributing. And I want to just know, if, if should, should we focus on one or the other? Should it all be about entrepreneurship? Should we, or should we have the two tracks? Because you're right getting a job is different than starting and creating jobs but there's still good ways for economic empowerment i just don't think I, you can i'm gonna let you answer but i don't yeah. think you can get a job without thinking entrepreneurial in america in the 21st century well that i didn't because think i didn't i didn't know that i because I thought, that's because your job is to create value right. and this is what we're talking okay. about Actual, so we're all we're all lined up yeah we're all whether you're an organization whether you're a comcast we're okay. saying that okay you can't just be a worker I'm from Philly. The right. idea that I'm just going—I'm going to leave my work at home right. at the office at five o'clock. Okay. Okay. That was our mentality. Right. But okay. you got to be all in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, all right. right. And I think I right. really—I want to go back to your your question. Yeah. Is it futile to teach black children to go into technology? Hmm. It is absolutely not futile. Okay. This is again the mm. first time we could forecast going right. back to Dr. Sullivan, Elijah yeah. Muhammad, mm -hmm. Marcus mm -hmm. Garvey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the first time you could look at a global economy and say there's That's an right. opportunity for That's full right. That's employment. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. For an entire generation. Yes. All right. Yeah. So the issue though is our vision is very much on our programs right. and not on our community. Right, right. I want to be very clear about that. Okay. I'm really, really, really passionate about this. If Silicon Valley, Bill Draper just spent half a million dollars in the Kaduna, Nigeria ICT technology hub. Meltwater, a Korean from Norway, set up the Meltwater Institution. So you're seeing Silicon Valley take its money to Africa to bypass kids in America, black children, because we don't have a community vision around what our children are supposed to be. And I'm sharing with you, there is a time right now to claim the space while we're flying. Everybody else is worried about everybody else. Nobody's worried about black children right now. Right. Hmm. Right. So fly below radar, claim the space. Go all in on the space, whether we are getting a job hmm. where you learn the dynamics of a company okay. and then spin yourself out. Got it. Or And so it's a this and that, okay. not a this or that. Okay. It starts with a, let's go Sullivan-esque if we need to. Okay. This is the time, this is the place, this is, this is our now. Understood. I just am very concerned that we, we right. tend to focus very much on these very important programs that we're all doing, right. mm -hmm. but we could, just as an example, right. I'm mm -hmm. just gonna say an example, yeah. mm -hmm. deliver a, pro, a, a vision for a part of a city that other people are doing. North right. Philadelphia is, that, is the, the right. space we're talking about right now. Right. In that space, there's job training, mm -hmm. there's housing, mm -hmm. 
there is uh, business startup mm -hmm. and venture capital. That's called mm -hmm. an ecosystem. Right. Until we get it together and show that we can deliver it, the one-offs are going to keep saying, is it worthwhile? Because it's a great question. Right. Bridget. It's a right. great question. But the answer is no, it's not futile. So let me throw back at you. And you guys all know I'm right where you are, but I got to just push because, you know, when we you have an opportunity to really get into it, I'm going to push a little bit because if it gets dialed down then to relationships, I think Tim mentioned it and I know Dean and I know Dr. Kevin Johnson mentioned it, you know, Diversity in tech is lacking. It's lacking everywhere. It's lacking in the tech jobs. It's lacking in the tech funding. You know, we have an actual venture capitalist from New York, Dr. Um, not Dr., but Gayla Jennings O'Byrne, who's in our audience today, who came from New York, whose her whole focus is investing in women of color, particularly Latina and black women venture capitalists. And she had to do that because no other people were. So if that's the case, that there are not that much opportunities to build relationships to get the capital, then even if we have our ecosystem in North Philly, even if we have our, our workforce development, even if we have the education to get tech and to be entrepreneurial in your job, if you are not still getting the opportunity to get the money, the capital, the relationships to get to even, you know, 500,000 in revenue, like, then where, again, are, where is the community? Where is the, what are we building here? How are we, again, moving the dial? Dean. <coughs> I think Tim mentioned the word innovation. Okay. And, and I want to give an example of a company that's here, uh, Motor Matters. They do custom shirts and custom suits. Um, and they've been selling custom suits and custom shirts with very, very, very little startup money. Mm. Um, and But they're supply chain experts. They know people in uh, Hong, uh, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Italy. And so with, with innovation, they don't, money is not really that their issue. The issue okay. is getting the word out and selling custom suits and support and, and supporting that, uh, that process. They don't need tech developers. Okay. They, so they, they, we their their yeah. website is being launched, but they've been doing it with, um, with a Facebook page. Got it. Uh, so they've already, you know, did a significant amount of, I think maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of um, right. revenue. Um, just through that process. Okay. So um, if you, another thing is if you take a few developers now, um, a few developers can get together and get a product to an MVP stage or even a penetration, which is a market stage, with very little unity, very little capital. Hmm. And then, because the capital early is so costly anyway, so you're better off developing your market before you start asking for capital. Um, I see where you're going you with this. So right. love, to get right. back to the love theory. It's always love theory. Find what you love. <laughs> find a good idea. Find Solve a problem. Right. If you're in a neighborhood where there's a problem, you are the best person, the expert to solve that problem, and then you just build it. Mm -hmm. Get exposed by Dr. Johnson, Michelle Johnson's program, Dr. Jamie Bronson Bracey's program, and then I'm assuming that starts part of the resources and access to build your ideas mm -hmm. so that you can then create your destiny. Is that what we're saying? Like, find find the passion. This, like, this, like, this suit company, that's not a tech company. It's like Tim said, but it's still a good company. Right. It's mm -hmm. still an innovative idea right. well, that, that's, that's just, you know, it's still building itself. Well, it doesn't not, have to be tech per se, but, but at it, least it, it's it, a start. Mm -hmm. It's a dream. It's, yeah. a, it's a foundation. Yeah, that's how you start building a community, though. Right. Okay. Is what, Dean, I mean, what I'm hearing, so it's not even, or first of all, I have to be very clear. I'm, I'm not currently investor, so I don't want to, I'm okay. not, a, a, coming out as, as, Disclaimer. as a state treasurer, <laughs> I have ethics, okay? Got it. And so yes, sir. I am not <laughs> Absolutely. an investor. Put I have been an investor, on the and document. I have many investors, okay? <laughs> so I just want to be very clear. But, 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 yes. I mean, it's a, it's, this is a fascinating it conversation. Is. It is. And I wanted to be relevant, so though, because people hear talking heads all the time. I know. I've been in so many panels. I, I, I don't do panels because I want them to be relevant. But you have this excellent panel of real people who are real. You know, we're not talking about some esoteric stuff. We're just trying to break it down. And I'm just telling you that I've invested, I've over-invested in black companies and got mm. zero return. <laughs> okay? Mm. It's not money. It is not money. It is not money. Our issues are more community related mm, and related okay. to our education. Right. Okay, let's get off of that. You, I don't care what, because I don't care what you start. It, it doesn't matter what business you start. That's what Dean is saying. Right. 
You just have to be good at something. And right. You gotta want to be good. Right. And you gotta want to get better. If you can't, if you can't write, and I, you may laugh about it, but this is not just black community. This is America. This is public education. If you can't write, get better at writing. Don't give me something that you, it's, it's misspelled and doesn't convey a clear thought. Okay. Mm. Go back and learn. We got to do that. I will. I did it. I'm mm -hmm. gonna. I'm gonna make myself better. Everybody mm -hmm. at this table makes, and, and you in this room have made yourself better. Right. It's just that you're not sitting up here, but I know you've made yourself better. Mm -hmm. There's something, don't get in front of me with a hole, because believe me, those, those little precious little secrets mm. come out. Right. Your own embarrassments about yourself mm. will come out, and they come out at the most awkward times, right. okay? <laughs> Let's get it together. Mm. Just work on yourselves. Mm. Yeah. And, and like you said, if you find something in the community that, that's not fixed is a problem, it's not a business. It could be the swings. It could be the, the junk, the garbage, the trash on our street. Just get it done. Pick it up. Right. Believe me, that is part of being, becoming an entrepreneur. It's not being afraid to lead something, even if it looks embarrassing. 90% of what you do is, could be embarrassing mm -hmm. because you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. But can you just deal with failure? So I'm just going to leave that, or fail that back around. <laughs> and before we jump back to Dr. Michelle Johnson, you're listening to 900 AM WRD Philadelphia. We are here for Philly Tech Week, and the panel that we are excitingly on is called From Consumer to Creator. We have a stellar lineup that is definitely putting out the information for all of us. And for those of you who are on social media, please hashtag consume to create. That's the first one. The second one is WRD Wilco, W I L C O P T W 17. 900 AM WRD. So let's jump back into it. Dr. Michelle Johnson, I know you were definitely wanted to um, pinch in and definitely talk about a little bit of, of what you were thinking about with these questions. Yeah, I wanted to kind of bring it back to the tech. I mean, it's a little bit <laughs> harder to start a tech company. This is maybe just my thinking on this. I don't think, I think it is, we have a lot of ideas. And right. I, wanna, I wanna stress where the ideas come from. Okay. I actually went to Stanford, so I was in the, the, the mm. Silicon Valley for you six there. years. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the PhD students were working on Google and Netscape, and one of my PhD advisors was one of their advisors. And it was, they took their PhD concept and made it into Google. And they took their PhD concept and made it into immersion, which mm. was one of the force feedback. So it, it, sometimes it's that research rich space or that collaborative rich space that brings out an idea. But you don't even have to do it on the PhD level to come up with good ideas. One of the things I wanna stress with undergrads or students, sometimes you're doing your tinkering stuff or you're in a class and they pitch a problem, a community-based problem, a tech-based problem, mm. some idea, and you come up with a cool idea. Something that students don't realize is universities do not own your IP. If you're mm. an undergraduate and you are paying money to go to school, if you come up with an idea in your school, in your class, and you get a grade and your teacher marks it up, it can become the germ of something cool. And a lot of students don't realize that. One of the things that I teach a class on rehabilitation, engineering, and design, and one of my problem sets is come up with something for people with disability. And people will come up with some fantastic ideas. And I'm like, hey, this is a cool concept. Mm -hmm. Have you considered thinking about claiming your IP on this idea? Then the second thing is, how do I get access to being able to incubate my idea? Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes that's the next step with a tech idea, is where do I go to kind of, if I'm not in the university environment where I have the resources to build, to get access to a lab, and electronic lab where do I go I think there is a move in Philly in the maker spaces there are people mm -hmm. who are small entrepreneurs getting together to form collaborative spaces to tinker I think we need to identify those because if you have a good tech idea it often benefits from having people around to provide you with kind of where do you go and make it if you can't be like um, 
um, Steve Jobs where his dad cleared out his garage and gave mm -hmm. him a space to tinker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if your parents can't do that for you, then find some of these maker spaces in Philly right. and join in with a group of people who want to do that innovation. And I think then the third space is formal incubators that you can write competition to. It comes back to the ability to pitch your ideas. So I think writing is, is a first principle. To be able to pitch your ideas, to get someone to be excited about it, is then the next step. Once you have this prototype, this concept, to get someone to go, oh, come into this incubator. We don't have a lot of money for you, but we can expose you to people who can help you figure out where your business model, all these other things. So I think we need to think about allowing our students to understand that when you have a good idea, mm -hmm. especially if you're in the university system, it's yours, you know, mm -hmm. write it up, claim it, claim mm -hmm. your IP, but then look for other opportunities to incubate the idea, to get it into a prototype space so that you can then try to pitch it to get investments. I think something that you're saying is, is really interesting because the idea component is crucial. But there's an interesting time we're in right now. I was talking about this with um, uh, Gala this morning and uh, our partners for our, our event tonight because we're in an interesting time where consumer problems, social issues, there's government backing, there's a sense of urgency, all kind of perfect storming right now. And because of that, it's allowing really opportunity for underrepresented communities to shine in a way because if there's an issue that is ailing communities, the only people, the best people I think to really fix those problems and figure it out are the people that live in those communities. Like if you live in a neighborhood in North Philly where you're experiencing there's a, a you know, just a, a crime issue or there's a, a poverty issue in some way, you might be the best person to figure out how to definitely make a, a way out of it because you're living it. And if there's more emphasis and support around solving problems because of the technology of social issues and then Twitter and all these types of other platforms that are fueling light to these issues, it, is tech then really, we are maybe in the golden age of technology. And I know, Timmy, it's not all about tech, but if that's really where we're gravitating toward, then how do we make it so that we are using it to, to change and wanna, to make and to solve problems and all of that? Dr. I wanna, Bracey. I actually want to jump in on, on the, the IP notion and yeah. the notion that people within communities can solve the problems. It's absolutely true that those of us who live in a community can identify that something's wrong. We can identify the symptoms. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always mean that we understand what are the resources that are available to okay. solve the problem. Understood. And the other thing, Bridget, yeah. black folks need to really be aware of, there is something called gentrification of your ideas, hmm. where you're being asked to come in, have these community meetings, discuss your problems, and then a university cohort will oh. take it on as a classroom problem, and you don't see your idea ah. if it's coming to market. So let's, let's, be, let's have That's real talk in here. Huh. Michelle's absolutely right. If you're an undergraduate and you come with an idea, yes, that's your idea. You go into master's level program, yeah. every university in this region owns your idea if we're paying for anything for you to come oh, to graduate school. Okay. So you have to be very, very careful about where our ideas come from okay. and where they go. That's why I'm, I have a very clear dividing line between my temple work Got it. and my studio work in the community because I don't want the young people who come up in our little maker space and I'll tell you, we have a studio maker space in Jill Scott's building in the Blues Bay Foundation right. on the third floor. That's where we teach software development, right? But the maker spaces that popped up five years ago, because quite frankly, our, our white friends were excited about maker spaces, yep. half of them have shut down oh. before we could get access to them. And that's why I was saying to you, some of these universities huh. leveraging access to these maker spaces inside the universities to create the prototypes, okay. take your idea, Talk to the person like me at any university in this region and say, I have an idea. Can we get together with OIC and talk okay. about some problems we found? And I'm going to give you one example, if, if y'all bear with me. Yep. It, uh, on 12th Street, right, in Glad Federal Hall, it's almost impossible for people who live in that part of North Philly to get through Temple's main campus because mm -hmm. the students will not stop walking. They're ignorant. <laughs> I drive through there and I work there and I see it. we have to get campus security to stop the car to stop the kids from walking so people can get to work in the morning. So an engineering student came up with this idea. What if 
in all of the anxiety that Bridget's talking about. Hmm. What if we created a way for these students who have looking at their cell phones, growing across that walk, and these, these drivers who want to hit the horn could somehow interact and feel each other's pain? Hmm. So an engineering student said, what if we put out a sign that says, it's a flashing sign that's gonna get their attention, smile at the guy in the car or the woman in the car trying to get to work. That's a simple problem that will stop some of the anxiety that's going on oh, between people right in that community. Attention. Okay. A different kind of using technology hmm. to improve relationships in a community hmm. versus the community, y'all come up with all the problems you all have and bring them to us and we'll solve them for you. Right. That's not, that's not ever going to work again. It's okay. Not, and the other, the only other thing I was saying, now I'm yeah. be quiet the rest of this. No, time. no, 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 absolutely not. Well, this, <laughs> when we no. talk about vision, I want to go back to that. Yeah. One of the things I've always been inspired. I was Leon Sullivan was one of my first scholarships to mm. college, mm -hmm. um, and what he said was that you know there are specific industries that are coming in that we can develop talent around. I would share with you nothing's changed in American capitalism. What are the top three industries that could impact Philadelphia right now? Healthcare, we know. Mm. Energy is the other. What's a third? What are we known for in the city of Philadelphia? And my brother friend is here who works on a, a collaboration with us. It's entertainment technologies. The last meeting we had, uh, Joe Scott's team was represented. Lady Gaga's team was represented. Philadelphia produces the best music and technology talent in the world. Hmm. Did you all know that? I didn't know that. No. On every tour around the world, there's apparently, am I correct? Someone from Philadelphia, so I, I would not have known that if I was not out in the community with this young brother saying, no, we, people want us. Mm. So pick a space that Philadelphia is known for music. Okay. Where you, we're known, we can claim a space in technology, yep. produce the talent, but also produce the talent that codes the virtual reality experiences of those concerts. Hmm. Produce the talent that can produce the wearable technology so when you go into a concert, your shirt is flashing. Hmm. You understand? Look at the industry and identify the ways inside that industry where we can own that part of the industry. Hmm. So it's energy, and I'm going to be very clear. The, it is the petrochemical offshoots out of the Marcella Shale drilling. If you didn't hear it before, you've heard it from me. Norway built two ships in Philadelphia's shipyard to ship those petrochemicals to go make plastics. And Philadelphia's sitting here, and nobody wants to do manufacturing of plastics. Hmm. We're talking about everything from the way this pen looks to your plastic fork you just bought at ShopRite. So hmm. there are opportunities in industries that are not necessarily straight in our face. All we have to do is pivot a little. Do you all understand? Yeah. Just pivot a little. Own entertainment, music, and technology. Own advanced manufacturing or plastic manufacturing. Own something, but figure out the industries that are going to be in place for the next 20 years. Put our people into those spaces as workers as owners, as innovators, and then go back to these universities and say, hey, I got a good idea. Where's that Dr. Johnson at? I want to build something with her. So mm. that's, that, that's some, I just wanted to share those brief thoughts. I mean, absolutely. And I think, <laughs> and I think, I think you're absolutely right. Like, look around where you are to see where the opportunities are instead of seeking, instead of seeking so that it looks so far away. It can just be much more at hand. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, Dr. Kevin Johnson, I think that that's what you're doing at OIC. I think, Dean, you've been doing that for years. And that's what you're also teaching your kids at, you know, University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Michelle Johnson. Um, so if, if this is where we are then, then how do we tell a young person or even someone who's, you know, outside of being young, just someone who wants to have a career change young or at young at heart or, or an older person in their, you know, between, you know, 25 to 35 that wants to get into this industry, what's the best way? What are the on-ramps? What are the, um, you know, roadmaps that, you know, you can just offer? Where, where's, where's the trusted people, like you said, Dr. Bracey, that won't take an idea, but will help, you know, fuel it and help encourage it and help embrace it and help put it out there? Because if that's the case, then it goes back to what Tim said. We need to, it, it's, it's community. We need to build it. We need to develop it. We need to have our ecosystems that are holistic for us, um, which we're doing. But how do we make them much more available to everyone? Yes, Dean. This is pretty simple. Um, we talk about mentorship, and you know we used to have this thing: black community, each one teach one. So it's like each one teach ten now. Because if you take 
um, Adris over there at, at the city. He's mentored tons of people at, at the, at the um, at IT department in the city. Um, you take Stanley over there. He's being mentored by, by you hear me, Stanley? You're being mentored mm -hmm. by, De by Dex over there. So people seek out these subject matter experts. Okay. And, and organically, as right. you said before, the people are teaching people and people are skilling up as well as providing opportunity. So okay. it, is, it is a simple mentorship model. Okay. Okay, so. Just goes down to mentor, okay. And, and really, I mean, right. think about everything else we do, whether right. we learn, whatever, learn right. basketball, anything, right. all through some personal right. relationship and mentorship. So if you, if you really do it, and put it on steroids a little bit, right. okay, that right. If, you, if, you, if you look it out over a period of three to five years, mm -hmm. you'll find out that you have hundreds of people in the community right. that'll be skilled up. And once they skilled up, they'll find the opportunities. So then it goes back to you can't be what you can't see. True. Well, we're going to go to questions. Again, mm -hmm. you're listening to 900 AM mm -hmm. WRD Philadelphia. We are here for Philly Tech Week. And this is the WRD Wilco panel from consumer to creator. So if you have a question, you're in the audience. Steph Renee is going to go around and pass out the mic. Definitely, I think this is a ripe panel for any type of question to come up. I think we should just be real and, and ask just where we are and how we get there. Um, but so if anyone wants to start that off. And, and I was going to say, it might be easier if we have people come line sure. up because sure. that way we'll be able to go through and when sure. we need to cut it off, it'll sure. be easier than running sure. back and forth across the room. Absolutely. So if we could have people start making their way over here towards the broadcast table. If you have a question you would like to ask, we would love to facilitate that. Sure. And, and as Brother Tyrone has right absolutely. on, he will absolutely. also get the ball rolling absolutely. for our Q&A. And again, that's hashtag consume to create, hashtag WRD, Wilco, PTW17. Brother Tyrone. Yes. You know, Dr. Johnson, you had mentioned how that there needs to be something to put in front of women in order for them to get into technology. I think that's what's going on in our community. See, in our community, we seem to not believe that we can do better. So we really need to have these type of conversations and getting people to understand and believe that we can change our community if we utilize some of these concepts that allow us to change. So how do we go about trying to get the community to be more aggressive and wanting to bring about change through technology. Got it. I'll, I'll have the, I'll put it to the rest of the panel as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, great question. I, I think it's, it starts with um, the parents. I think it starts with our, um, because I am an advocate of getting to the kids and building kids up and building their their feeling of cap their know-how and feeling that they're able i think the prob uh, i think if if our if as parents we're not getting together to encourage um, our children we're going to leave them growing with that self doubt and it only grows and grows as they go higher and higher in education so that's one thing but i also think um, programs like OIC is, is a place to uh, begin, is to send your kids to those programs or, um, I, or identify places, uh, clubs or technology clubs that you can send your kids to. One of the things that are, that's happened, Dean came in, um, he was a, um, one of the people who started the um, first robotics, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but one, that program is a robotics program for high school kids, but they also have gotten primary school kids involved. And one of the things that is a challenge is many of these robotics clubs for primary school are not in black communities in mm. the black. Um, right. And these are really great opportunities. And I, and I want us to begin to form them in our, in our primary schools. It's for really young kids to get them exposed. Um, they work with all these different uh, robotic systems. But the one thing that I'm saying is, I've seen a difference in the kids that come through freshman year, the difference between those that have participated in these tech programs and those that haven't. And it kind of is a, 
uh, their problem solving skills coming in as freshmen much more on point than those that haven't been. So I would encourage, you know, in my sphere of my sphere is to get your kids into um, the software, you know, coding programs, hmm. OIC, start a, a young kids robotics program in your primary school, be advocates to get your kids exposed to these things and not just, um, you know, all kids so that they can feel that, oh, I'm confident I could do this. And there's such a sense of accomplishment. They, when the, when I see the six, eight, 10 year olds building robots and they're happy that it works, that lasts, that stays with them. So I think that's important. Anyone else? The earlier the better. Mm. Right, that's the bottom line. I mean, uh, meet my grandson where he's at, you know, at seven years old and get him involved. So the earlier, the, you don't have to do a whole lot of psychological buildup. It'll become natural <laughs> to the child. Mm -hmm. I mean, they see, you know, you know, they see their father or their cousin or their brother doing something, they automatically will pick it up like it's a natural, something natural to do. So all of this psychology later on won't, won't, won't be necessary. Well, as a cognitive psychologist, I will say, I like to flip high school kids. <laughs> I like to get them. And we are very successful at engaging them um, in, in the stuff that they use already. So I would say, you know, um, this, this idea that we have, uh, we have the ability to close the achievement and access gap really begins with us deciding to teach them how to be competitive. Mm. Yeah. Could we please start with not the missionary viewpoint, but with the competitive viewpoint? Mm. That's all I have to say. Which kind of goes to the soft skills component, Dr. Bracey. And I think we never, we never talk about all the time the soft skills. Mm -hmm. And that kind of mm -hmm. goes like everyone has mentioned it. That's right. the culture. That's yes. like right. being able to be at a company or being able to have the grit and tenacity to start a business. Right. That's all stuff that you don't really learn by just being in a classroom. You learn that by mentorship mm -hmm. or you learn it by being around other business people mm -hmm. and that's a big part even to your question brother Tyrone like that's a that's a cultural uh, a manifestation that we need to start growing more in our communities if we want to stay in tech because we can get there but we need to stay there and that's part of our that's part of probably why we're lacking in different ways Tim, I, you wanted to say something? You want to go no, to the next no, question? We, I, no, I'm just looking There's at a the line. line. Yes. If, we, if, we, yes. if everybody yes, yes, comments, yes. we yeah, won't we get them all in. True, true, true. Yes. All right, give us your name, your section of the city, and your question. Um, my name is Lynn Peterson. I actually live in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, but I grew up in Philadelphia. Yes. Um, I want to make a shameless plug for my brother-in-law, who graduated from University City High School, mm -hmm. who was named Bea. Uh, he got a Bea Award. For the engineers here, they know that's the Black Engineer oh, yes. of the Year mm -hmm. Award. Yes, He got that this year. He, and and um, his son is working with me. I started a business. My granddaughter and I started a business. His son is a branding expert. Mm. So he, and he told me yesterday, Auntie, I just moved into this apartment, but I just got this contract for $10,000 to brand a woman who is also starting a company, too. So it's out there. Oh, the thing I bought, the reason why I bought up Bea, they indicated at the awards ceremony that, and Rayathon was there, my brother-in-law happens to work for Dy um, General Dynamics, and um, he's also retired Chief Master Sergeant, and a Philly kid, he grew up in Palton Village. But the point of that is that what was said at the Bay Awards was that there are gonna, there's a need for one million engineers in, by 2022. That's five years from now. Are we developing enough engineers, basically? Okay. And it, just because there's such a long line of questions, if there is a way that maybe just one or two patients can just answer it very quick so we can make sure we get to everybody's question. But to your point, sister, so the question is, why are there not a lot of black engineers just out there? Mm, well, that goes to that very controversial pipeline problem. Is it the pipeline? The are we teaching? Math. The issue is digital is literacy and math. Okay. If our kids can't really understand and read and comprehend word problems, they're not doing well. And so part of my portfolio at Temple is retention. Uh, we are hemorrhaging, maybe graduating 15% of black students who start end up with an engineering degree. Uh -huh. Women are even worse. So I would say that uh, if we're going to go all in as a community to be competitive, we need to be competitive in math. I would, I would also just, uh, to, to just plug in and just say that, we're, I don't see Sarah's here. Uh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if everyone knows, but that's my wife, Sarah. Mm -hmm. But our son, I say that because our son, Elijah, got accepted into numerous uh, mm. 
colleges for mechanical engineer and then decided he had a tough decision came down to the last wire hmm. which just didn't make us feel great but he he's going in to be a mechanical engineer nice so, yeah nice and doc, yes, doc, I, I would just caut- I would just see that the common thing that I see is parents um, or family allow their kids to opt out in junior high mm. and in high school of the tougher math classes. Do not allow that because if they don't get the basic algebra. T- Ge- uh, geometries they can't compete on the other levels so don't allow them to take the easier math space provide the tutor get the help but make sure that they get the foundational math prior to within high school in order for them to be competitive and I see people doing that a lot and I think then it just totally it's tragic because it then just really goes just goes downhill from there. and that's worse for women so, you know, that's also a very dismal statistic for women to be engineers. They have to get past the I'm not used to it or it's not for me. Uh, but yes, thank you for your question. Next question. Your name and your question. Uh, my name is Brianna West. And my question is in the spirit of mentorship, um, in addition to attending events like this and, you know, involving yourself in the community and things like that, how would you suggest someone who is start just starting off in, like, the tech industry to navigate sort of getting a mentor? Like, is it really just as easy as finding someone's contact information online and, like, mm-hmm. inviting them for coffee? Or are there events, you know, mm-hmm. frequently in the city that you can go to and sort of, like, learn about what other people are doing? How would mm-hmm. you suggest I navigate Dr. that? Dr. Kevin Johnson, I would love if you could yeah. weigh in on that. Yeah. Um, so several things. I mean, one, what I would share with you is that coming to events like this Mm -hmm. and do you have a business card i don't i have my resume so i'm I'm asking some specific questions you want to come to events like this ready Mm -hmm. as i tell my students opportunity only knocks once and Mm -hmm. you have to be ready for it Mm -hmm. and so what i tell students is get your own business cards made up you know you have an email address you have a cell phone so therefore you have a way in which to brand yourself so you want to first do that and so that's one way Another way is in a whole tech community, like taking advantage of Philly Tech Week, is to Mm -hmm. go around at different events. Absolutely. You know, get connected with one of the meetup groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do some volunteering. I Mm -hmm. mean, one of the things that I did, uh, just from my own kind of background, is that I would just volunteer. I mean, I'm not in tech, but I'm just dealing with how do you get a mentor. And once, one example I would probably share with you when I was at Morehouse, um, I was just taking the robe of a clergy person, carrying their robe. And hmm. doing something as small as that right. landed me a job to work with Dr. Otis Moss Jr., who's retired hmm. now. But that literally opened up a door for me that now I am where I am today. And relationships. So it's relationships. And so, hmm. you know, it's not always, you know, finding this mega star right. to be your mentor. It's about finding the people who are really under the radar, right. who are doing the great work. And then you go and work for them. And then they'll begin to connect you with other people. Last thing I will share with you is that um, I was at this program at Case Western Reserve University uh, and their kind of certificate of nonprofit management. And the gentleman said, your job is to get into orbit. He said, and if you can get into orbit, you will see how all the other orbits are overlapping. And so that's my Mm. charge to you. And just a little shameless plug on my end. So for you, we do have the Woman in Tech Soiree, which is tonight, which is fun, uh, hosted by Mogulet, which is an organization I started. Yeah. And that's about um, basically finding a place and a space yeah. for you to network, connect, collaborate, conversate, and, and basically plug in. So if you go to Philly Tech Week, the site, just go to Google Philly Tech Week, and it'll say what subject matter, look up soiree, all the information is there. Starts she says she's already planning to be yes. there. Yes. And so you're ahead of the game. You are. But yeah, but great question. Absolutely. Got to know where to go. Your name yes, and ma'am. your question? Yes. My name is Janice James. I'm from Overbrook section of the city. Yes. My question is, and why I'm here, and shout out to WRD. I love this Absolutely. station. Absolutely. I don't know what we would be with black people without this station. We Absolutely. really need to support it. Absolutely. Give our many, many dollars as you can. Sell cookies, whatever you have to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. That being said, I am here because I'm, my concern is my son, it started out like this. My son decided a couple of years ago we needed some computers in the house. I said, okay. Hmm. Now I have three computers in the house across from my dining room table. I cannot control this. I see as I'm going throughout the house, they are constantly on games and movies and this and that, and I'm so, so frustrated. 
And uh, also, a lot of people have the smartphones now, so when they're not on the computer and doing a bunch of nonsense in between, when they're crunch time and they have to do their homework, that they are on the smartphones with a lot of other, more nonsense. And I think that a no, more um, need to be reaching out to parents concerning some of this. The technology is all up in our house, hmm. but we are not harnessing it in the right direction. Interesting. Okay. So you have the access, but you need the other component to use the access. Anybody on that? Where's Brother Tyrone Reed? So one of the things that um, we started in North Philly, just as a trial, was the Seniors in Tech initiative to have our, uh, our students, there were some engineering students who would come over to the building up on North Broad and invite all of our uh, mature uh, residents to come in and bring all their tablets, bring all their phones. And what really started as just a tech sharing of information turned into this beautiful discussion around how different generations relate to each other, uh, what students needed to understand and young people needed to understand about the culture of being black in Philadelphia mm. and how not to let this technology get up inside their brain and, and turn them ignorant. And so mm. it was a very, so we're going to continue that in the fall, I guess, with a, 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 Tyrone just started bringing people up to the, to, to the center. Yeah. So to your point, it is about using technology not just as a tool to get somewhere but sometimes facilitating how the relationship should grow because if i can teach five seniors how to skype with their grandchildren somewhere then we've moved the needle where before they just couldn't get to each other other than by phone hmm. so i think that there are some ways to use it but i'm i'm with you i i'm over all of the tech uh uh immersion right now i, I understand the power of it i don't facebook i don't have time to facebook but I, what I do, I understand the power of it, but I'd rather call Dean, Brother Dean, where you at? And have that kind of immediate reaction. So technology is never going away, but there's a way to bring the, the generations together to better appreciate and use it. Hmm. Anyone else? I see the church is quiet a little bit on this question. <laughs> Everybody's kind of in a hush. <laughs> I'm just trying this conversation <laughs> Because this is a, right. this is a true serious yeah. problem. Mm. Because with all the energy the children are spending on these cell phones and computers right. and everything, we can send a rocket to the moon with all the energy, but it's just of no effect. It's just ignorance. They're just being amusing themselves. When we know what that word means, not to think. The training. I amuse. Mm -hmm. I not Muse think. Right. I'm using themselves. They're right. not thinking. And they're spending thousands of hours. If they use that same technology for thinking, all the, all the, uh, the uh, um, information that is out there under their noses, this is a, a conversation that really needs to go on and it needs to be disseminated to parents that are frustrated and trying to help their children. We are the first mentors, and that's why I'm here as a mentor of my children. I know most, my children are very intelligent, and it's just a sad, what they say, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yes, ma'am. Next question. Excuse me, yeah. how, how old are your children, though? How old are your children? Just, so the, the, okay. 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 From 30 to 14, yeah. She okay. said 30 down to 14. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Yes, next question. Hello, everybody. My name is Darla Wolf. And first, I want to thank you for your, your words. Uh, you know, you're very inspirational. I think you're right on the money. Um, I am a woman in tech and a 20-year veteran of the Philadelphia corporate environment. And I recently launched a uh, startup that marries people who are middle-aged, mid-career, with opportunities at startups to promote entrepreneurship in uh, more mature people. Let's go with that. Because in addition to um, the, uh, the, the problems with racism and sexism, there's also ageism that comes into launching a new business and startups. So my question is, do you have any advice, especially as we move into technology that's going to be disrupting traditional career paths, for example, um, AI and, and automated cars are going to disrupt people who drive taxis and buses. Do you have any thoughts on people who might be mid-career looking to make a change or people who might be a little bit older um, learning technology for the first time? Hmm. I tell a joke. I always say that if Einstein was around, he couldn't get a job right now uh, because <laughs> ageism is real. Um, but what hmm. I, w I would suggest 
for people of my age bracket would be to um, form organizations with themselves because I think anybody who's been doing anything 20 years should be teaching somebody something. So uh, they have a lot of expertise to offer, but they're not going to get hired. It's, we, mm. it's that type of it's that type of society we live in. People oh. people don't hire people over 45 or 50. They don't care what they know. Wow. So, so that, then that's real. Where do you go with that? When well, they, they <laughs> the first have to, part they, of the population they, is they, that they, age. The ages, they have to organize within themselves. Interesting. Okay? Because they have power within themselves. Mm. So they, they, have to, they have to change their, their, their narrative. Mm. Okay? And leverage the power within themselves. But can I just say something about Darla's company, which I do know, Sweat Equity, is that there's still a lot of knowledge base between 45 to 60, Tons whatever. Of Most of it. And if the, what I like about Mark Darla's model is that it allows those people who are quote unquote unhirable right. to give back to the younger people who are starting up in a way that they can either get equity through sweat equity and or be an advisor and and or be hired because there's skills that the millennials and sure. whomever are not are lacking sure. that the gen xers and baby boomers still have That's true. grit is one of them mm -hmm. that entrepreneurial being an entrepreneurial that works at a place is one of them mm -hmm. that's that's a that's something that is not being learned that's so true. maybe that's even true. though they're not getting hired it goes i guess the girl goes right back to what you said dean you got to create your opportunities for yourself right well they have a value right so right they, they the gotta, value they got to leverage the value and yeah. that's what darla i think darla's model it, it still upgrades and highlights and exposes the value of that age group that's mm -hmm. not being hired by you know the, the, the VCs. You, you know her, so what is the I do. business? What is I don't know the Darla, business, so I didn't please. understand Darla. I didn't I didn't understand what the business is. So real quick, yeah. Okay, so my business matches. Yeah, <laughs> shameless plug. It matches um, established professionals and students to opportunities at startups, nonprofits, and emerging small business, and to minimize the risk to professionals who have financial obligations that young people don't have. Right, you're not just going to throw your mortgage money out the window or your car payment out the window. The jobs you get in startups, you can keep your primary job while you also work for the startup. So one of the things I heard, because the, the, the first part is, that's, a, that's what an executive search firm does. Well, so, not, not exactly. It's, it's to help promote your skill set and let you work in an environment without quitting your primary job. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's a, ver a version of that, right? So Using your second there, there's, time, yeah. right. So you know, you, you'll deal with the conflict piece. I, my brain goes from legal to mm -hmm. invent investment. So there's a conflict piece that you resolve, I guess. Mm -hmm. But as, in essence, the the core of your beginning is a search thing. It's so if your if if your business is disrupting the search process because search firms, they're highly highly graded. It's not just search like you're thinking. I'm looking for a job. It's we. We get you, we promote you, we get you. There's a whole range. And so in searches, they work with private companies, smaller companies, in finding established senior specialized folks and placing them in firms as well. It's so not I, I don't want to take up everybody's time. No. It's not a search It's firm. not the search it's thing? It's not the same thing, but okay. maybe we'll talk offline. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. And I just wanted to say, um, in interest of time, we have time for one more question. Oh, so no. those gentlemen who are at the back of our line, if you can hang around, if our uh, professionals, our panelists are able to address you individually after we're off the air, then we hope that they'll be able to do that. But this will be our final question. Oh, I'm glad I made it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Maps Bolt. I'm a local tech entrepreneur here. Mostly I'll make this quick. Um, I'm originally from the Bronx, and I definitely w had really great mentors, great teachers growing up, but everything that I was told that I could do, I had to like leave my home. I had to like, quote unquote, get out the hood, right? But I would have loved to have learned like financial literacy about home ownership so that when I grew up, I would have been able to live in the neighborhood that I grew up in. How do you, you talked about branding North um, Philadelphia, how do you, um, include the kids into that conversation, creating a sense of place. What are their dreams for staying there? What are their plans? Because when you talk about community, I really think about it in terms of like, there's lots of great opportunities here, but how do you make it so that the community has a sense of ownership over that place so it feels like they'll be there for 100 years, that they're investing, they're not just investing in entrepreneurship or wealth just so that they can go somewhere else? Hmm. For me? Like for anybody. Um, I think that we have to be very, very definitive about what community is, 
balance because community is like-minded people getting together. Right. And often we have this thing in the black community where we all tend to believe that everybody's on the same page at the same time. Um, in North Philadelphia, what's happening um, is that there are a lot of opportunities emerging that are outside of North Philadelphia coming in. The reason I'm saying North Philadelphia is because um, it is the last neighborhood that has not created an identity for itself. And so if we were going to say, um, we have very amazing institutions, but no cohesion among those institutions yet. So the planning that we've started already, again, starts with the young people who serve as the board of directors for our design studio that they created, right? Those young people are pairing up with the young people out of the Blues Bay Foundation and Junior Music Executive. Those young people are then connecting with my young people who are undergraduates in STEM at Temple University. So we just consider ourselves the facilitators. The next step in the, the strategy is to connect with Dr. Johnson, connect with Broad Street Renaissance, and start moving those institutions that are specifically designed to build community to put in place, this is our vision, you guys are public servants to help actuate the vision. So it's coming from a young person's perspective and a young at heart perspective, that there's a way to create a place of, unit, of, of community and there are models out there that are highly effective. Hmm. Meltwater that I talked about in Ghana, right? There's Tech Square Labs in Atlanta. Right. There, are, there are a number of community economic development initiatives that start with a vision that this place can be an awesome place to work, live, do business, and learn. So our, we are now at that stage where I can finally say, Dr. Johnson, I need to talk to you. Right. We, we, we've, we've evolved. Can we now turn it over to the, the richness of the legacy that is OIC? Can we talk about having a venture capital initiative that, you know, Brother Tim may not put money into, but can guide <laughs> saying, look, if in North Philadelphia we're known for this, this is where the tech, tech startup company should claim a space right. that the market wants, not the good ideas we think the market should have. Mm. That's a big problem in the black community. We all come up with really great ideas that we think somebody wants to buy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. no one did the due diligence or the market analysis to say, there's a market for that. Trends. Mm -hmm. Trends analysis, forecasting. Mm -hmm. So my Xerox mm -hmm. side comes back out, right? There is no reason why we have the number of tech startups and failures, even in the majority community, except a lot of really good people came with really good ideas that they saw, thought somebody wanted to buy. Right. It made no sense. Mm. So this is the inability to go deep in technology and think deeply. Mm. We're all surface skimming with, what, with our own um, grandiose ideas based on the technology we think we, we, we understand, we really don't understand. Mm. So I would just say that's, that's where we're right. going right now. No Philly in the house! <laughs> <laughs> well, you all have been listening to 900 AM WRD Philadelphia. Before we close the panel out, um, I'd like just for each of the panelists to just sum up their final takeaways, a little piece of advice, whatever it is that you'd like to make as a final statement um, to really, really wrap up and bring full circle this wonderful, informative, dynamic, so needed topic of conversation today. Just want to thank you guys all, Tim, Dr. Kevin Johnson, Dr. Jamie Bracey, Dean Harris, and Dr. Michelle Johnson. If we can just give them a round of applause because they have been wonderful, expert, getting the, getting the word out to the people. And again, before we close it out and pass it off to Steph Renee, uh, again, if we can start maybe with Dr. Michelle Johnson and go down the line, just to give your, again, minute, just what your final, final pieces of words of, of wisdom that you like to share with the listening audience. So um, I, I wanna stress and bring it home to the part about um, starting the kids young and encouraging their, their exposure, not just to the use of the technology, but to the rigor of you know, getting the math done, <laughs> getting, um, asking the, the questions about their ideas. How does it work? How does, how do things, um, how does this electronic piece work? And getting them exposed to those clubs like OIC or software coder clubs or hardware clubs like the robotics club so that they can start being with, with other people that are excited about the tech. Because I think if you start there, then these pipeline issues that we talk about, I think that's the, 
that's the way to start plugging mm-hmm. the type the pipeline is mm-hmm. to get the kids excited at a young age and get the parents also becoming enablers of building their confidence the confidence will come when they see that they're able you know so i'll i want to leave it there thank you dr johnson Dean. I'm, I'm going to be a little more abstract and i'm going <laughs> to say um it starts with love and ends with love that love is infectious and if you use love you automatically will get the skills of the person you know, who's who's part of that love community so it starts and ends with love all right brother harris dr jamie bracy dream big and compete mm. learn to compete mm. Mm. dr kevin johnson uh for me it's it's how i kind of see my whole world and uh it is a shameless plug for my church and that mm. is simply to dare to imagine. Mm. Uh, when you think about our, mm-hmm. how we began uh, as a people, uh, we begin to think big and don't look for anybody else uh, to believe in you. You believe in yourself. And I share this last quote with you. It's by an anonymous writer and it says, some people succeed because they are destined to, but most people succeed because they are determined to. Mm. Most of us in here were not handed uh, a silver spoon. Mm -mm. everything that we have we've had to work hard for it and it's my hope that you'll continue to work hard and make your dreams a reality mr tim reese um i i like to say um it's never too late i think it's a little Mm. bit of what uh, dr johnson is saying and that is that um no matter where you are no matter where you are sometimes my my concern i hear with this is that it can make the person who did not do these other things we talk about that they're not they can't be in the game but you can be in the game yeah you just have to better yourself want to better yourself you can be in the game and entrepreneurship is not when i say entrepreneurship i use it a little more liberally meaning is not designed that you always have to build a company it's just the way you think Hmm. about marketing sales and finance I didn't know all those things. I didn't know those things. They don't teach you that in engineering. Mm-hmm. We're great engineers, but a lot of times we didn't even know how to sell the product. So what I'm saying is if you learn, if you think like an engineer, you're going to think about all the aspects of business and finance, and that allows you to then participate anywhere in the world. So that's my final words. And I'll say one final word. I think it takes a village. I think we've been saying that you know, throughout the, the, the hour and a half we've been together and I've been saying it for years, particularly when you're talking about tech, we're not in the age of silos anymore. There's so many stakeholders that are gonna be needed in order to create this ecosystem. Um, So partnerships are key, learning how to be a partner, learning how to create relationships are all key values that you don't have to go to a a workplace or apprenticeship program, that's just looking at yourself, seeing your story, sharing it with someone and creating a bond. We can do that very, very easily with our communities. So my name is Bridget Daniel, 37 weeks pregnant. Next year, I will have a little one with me. Always an honor to be with WRD family. On behalf of Sarah Lomax Reese, who had to run out, we always appreciate you being here. Philly Tech Week, I think, is one of the most knowledgeable weeks of the year, just because it brings us all together. And we always need a way to bring us all together. So thank you all. Before I hit it, it's Steph Renee. Again, consume to create. Thank you so much.